It's only with great reluctance that I record this lesson. There's a category of things I consider boring that I don't want to bore you with and I don't want to bore myself. And this falls squarely in that category. I might not even air it for a few weeks. But let's talk about intellectual property and a phrase startlingly few people have heard of. Fair use. Of course, I've been accused of stealing. I use other content in my videos all the time. For instance, a clip about Vinny to make a point about Vinny. A clip of Spanky I'm about to transcribe. So I'll get send-ups from people who don't understand fair use. But what tipped it for me was when I started to see others incur the same accusations. And recently, Rick Beato's been in the news for testifying to Congress about fair use abuse and so-called blocker farms. So let's talk about it. When is it okay to use others' content on YouTube? What's stealing and what's legal? Stay tuned. There are two flavors of that accusation which have been leveled at me. The first is rather basic and easy to discuss, and it involves reproducing other people's content on my channel. Now, of course, the headlines are about the corporate record labels and fair use abuse, but I still think starting with my own example is a good way to illustrate. Let's start with the baseline. I come clean about all the content I've used. A good example of this is my caravan lesson from last year. I've got clips of the movie Whiplash. Learning to set up figures in the big band idiom is a learning curve. Footage of the North Texas band playing. Bits of recordings of Tigon Hamasian and Gerald Clayton. All the way to clips of the Duke Ellington Orchestra playing back in the day. I'd a thousand times rather listen to Duke Ellington's haunting original. By the way, I'm not going to share examples of other YouTubers doing this legally in this segment. He's doing it too is a good argument, but it's not the strongest form of the argument. Anyway, the basic accusation I've seen leveled against me and those other YouTubers is simple. It goes something like, you can't use other creators' material without permission. It makes sense, right? When Hollywood wants to use a crappy 90s song in a rom-com, they need to pay for the rights. If you want to sell McDonald's Happy Meals, you can't simply open up your own kitchen and use McDonald's name without going through a lengthy and exorbitant licensure and franchise process. So why is it any different with YouTube videos? Well, what about if a public school wants to show Mississippi burning during a lecture about civil rights? By the way, that's an example I wrote into the lesson last fall, but it's become particularly relevant in August of 2020. Anyway, is that public school required to pay for the rights? After all, if I want to do a private screening of Pulp Fiction in my living room and charge people admission to see it, that scary FBI warning at the beginning of all those videos put me off it. Well, I'm a mushroom cloud laying mother mother well, it turns out the government saw an exception for use of content for non-commercial purposes and spelled it out in law. Showing Mississippi burning in a history class is different from charging your friends to watch Pulp Fiction in your home. Which, by the way, you'd never see these days because anyone could just rent it on Apple or Amazon for a couple bucks. Anyway, that distinction is the core of what you call fair use. One of the most misunderstood concepts amongst musicians and YouTubers. According to Stanford University, judges take four factors into account when judging whether use of someone else's content was fair use. The purpose and character of use. That means, have you transformed the original or did you simply reproduce it? That's broadly interpreted to mean parody and educational use, i.e. using an example to illustrate something, or to break it down and deconstruct it, is permissible. The nature of the work. This is less relevant when it comes to YouTube or music, but it tends to be more lenient to uses of published work than unpublished. The amount and substantiality. It's slippery, but essentially this factor is twofold. Amount is clear. A five second clip of a drum solo is more likely to be fair use than the entire drum solo. But substantiality? This is more about the spirit of the use. Using somebody else's copyrighted material as the soundtrack to my video, just to make my video sound cooler, would probably be a no-go. I'd even hesitate to grab a Keith Richards guitar riff as a hook or transition. I'd be using Keith's intellectual property to make me look cool, without transforming it or using it to educate. Finally, my favorite, the effect of the use upon the potential market. Could somebody reasonably use your video as a substitute for paying for the original? 
Having fun yet? Astute viewers may notice there's zero mention of one factor YouTubers reusing others' content often put in their descriptions. I'm not claiming this content is mine. Doesn't matter. Anyway, let's look at two examples from the YouTube canon, again without referring to anybody specific. The first is clear cut. Somebody screen captures a UFC fight and posts it unedited on YouTube. Sure, you're not charging money for it maybe, but that's just one part. It's not educational or transformative. They're using the whole thing or almost the whole thing. And some potential viewers would be dissuaded from paying for the pay-per-view when they can just get it for free. You could say the same for people who just post commercial music on YouTube with a graphic. If someone can find it on YouTube, that may dissuade them from paying even a dollar for the song on Amazon or Apple or for paying for a streaming service like Spotify. Example two, the drum breakdown. Number one, the act of breaking down a drum solo is educational. Number two, the creator of the video would have a stronger case if he or she was not monetizing that video. He or she would probably have a stronger case if they were using chunks of copyrighted material, for instance, a 30 second clip of a Steve Gadd solo, rather than the entire solo. Here's the clip. And here's how you play that. Accordingly, for someone who just wanted to listen to the whole song for free, a drum solo breakdown that jumps back and forth from clip to analysis would probably frustrate the would-be pirate who would seek another source. So drum breakdowns done right, pretty clear case of fair use. None of which has stopped YouTube's algorithm from cracking down on any use of copyrighted content, fair or not. And it's this blanket treatment of use of any copyrighted material that Rick Beato is railing against. That's the reason I avoided using, say, a Katy Perry song in my response to Adam Neely's video last summer. That would have been pretty clear cut as fair use, but I guarantee the algorithm still would have stuffed the video. There's the law, then there's the algorithm. I've even gotten copyright strikes on material I've obtained written permission from the artist to use. Don't get me started on the algorithm. So let's acid test fair use a little more by exploring a couple of other ways YouTubers interface with other people's content. And remember, when I said I wouldn't refer to other creators in the first half of this video, now is the part of the video where I will. The first case would be directly using another's content as a discussion point, or jumping off point, as Alex the French Guy Cooking does in this clip with Gordon Ramsay. Have a closer look at his recipe, the challenges that I see. Say oh, la la, English master. You don't put Dijon there, are you? and to get meta as I'm actually doing here with Alex. Would this be fair use? Well, Alex isn't simply reproducing Gordon Ramsay's content, he's using it to jumpstart a challenge. Gordon's work is published, Alex is using only a small amount and using it to illustrate a point, and Alex's video is not a reasonable substitute for someone who wants to watch the original, hence he's probably not hurting that creator's bottom line. So, in my opinion, a pretty clear-cut case of fair use. But what about the even more extreme case? referring to another work without actually reproducing any of it. Good examples of that would be Chael Sonnen talking about Conor McGregor's fights. Technically, he's referring to UFC 229. He's basing his whole broadcast off UFC 229. UFC 229 is doubtless bringing Chael views. He may even use Conor's likeness in the thumbnail. And how do we apply fair use here? If he's using a few clips of the fight, you look at those four standards. Is it transformative? Does it use a published work? Is the use excerpted and bracketed? And would it serve as a viable substitute for a pirate who just wanted to watch the fight without paying for it? But what about the fact of Chael's referring to Connor without even using any footage? Well, we have to be careful here, because if Connor could sue Chael for referring to him, we'd have to ban journalism. But I want to go even deeper for you guys, so I looked it up. Basically, you can't be sued in most states for referring to people. Exceptions, and bear with me for getting detailed, libel or slander, which basically means telling lies about somebody. Brad Pitt can sue the Inquirer if he deems it worth his time, but he'd have to prove it's false, it was spread with the intent of causing him material harm, and it actually did cause that material harm. The other shady instance is implying somebody endorses your product when they don't. If Tommy Hilfiger wants to use Lewis Hamilton's face on their ads, they need to pay him. But the YouTube channel Autosport can refer to Lewis all at once, and even use his likeness in its videos and thumbnails, and benefit from the extra traffic it provides, as long as they're not lying about him with the intent to cause harm, or using him to sell products, either by implying he endorses them or using his likeness in 
directly commercial appeals. Have I bored you to tears yet? It's only because we need a better reference point when we talk about this stuff. The last thing I'll say is there's a difference between a legal standard and a politeness one. Just because something's legal doesn't necessarily mean you should do it. But by the same token, let's be precise with our language. We shouldn't call something stealing when it's not. Anyway guys, hope you enjoyed this video which was cut across multiple dimensions in time and space. Hopefully we're not ripping a hole in the fabric of the space-time continuum. But I thought in light of Rick Beato's recent testimony in front of Congress, it was time for this finally to see the light of day. And number one, true to form, and number two, to get meta, I'm not directly monetizing this video and I'm not making a direct monetary appeal. But if you would like something free, I would recommend you click the link below the player and get on my mailing list. And I'll send you my completely free three video mini course, which I assert will make you better in the next three weeks than you've gotten in the previous six months. I should also disclose that if you're on the list, you will have the opportunity to sign up for my commercial products, but that that's completely optional and I'm not selling those directly from this video. Guys, hope you enjoyed this one. See you soon.